All right, open your Bibles with me, would you please? I want to talk to you this morning about facing the giants. And we've got to fight for the ones we love. How many of you love your family? You know, I love you. I love our church. I love our community. And I love you so much, I'd fight a bear for you. Well, well just be honest, I wouldn't fight a grizzly bear for you because they got claws and big gnarly teeth. Now, I wouldn't fight a panda bear because they know kung fu. Can I be honest with you? I would fight a care bear for you because I love you. Give the Lord another big thank you. All right. How many, of you, how many of you have ever faced a giant? Maybe you're facing one right now. Anybody ever face a giant? You know, when you're in a struggle for your loved one or for yourself, maybe your struggle is uniquely to you at this moment. And if you're really fighting in this physical struggle for physical health, maybe what's going on in Washington or at our capital or in our schools is not that important right now. It's important, but not as important because you're fighting for your life. What are the giants that we're facing and what humans, we humans, face every day? And I suspect that right now there are various ones of you facing different giants. Now, it's one thing to face these national giants or these big social giants, but we also face various giants. So let's just look at some giants that, that many of us are facing right now. And so, you know, it's not a shock to you. COVID. COVID's a real thing. They're taking advantage of it to divide us. But COVID's real. We don't make light of that. But that's a giant. And then the other things that are used to divide us are whether or not you should take a vaccine or is it really a vaccine and that starts a discussion and that divides us. And then mask, not just mask, but mask mandates. And we fall on one side or the other of that and then that divides us. And the idea behind all of this, the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of division creates so many dysfunctions even among believers and they become giants and the devil is a master at dividing us and he'll divide us and has successfully divided us over many things that are important to each of us and then he divides us through fear confusion not knowing who to believe what to believe and just because you believe it doesn't make it a fact. Just because you read it on Facebook doesn't make it true. So there's a lot of division going on. But the body of Christ, we have to face our giants. If we don't face our giants, the giants will take over. Spiritual, political, social, whatever the case may be. What are some of the giants? Well, there are those of you here that have the diagnosis of an illness. A terminal illness is what they would call it. Sickness, all kinds of sickness. COVID is another sickness, but sickness is still going on. And when you're sick and you desperately want to be well, maybe a mask is not a big deal to you, or maybe a vote or a politician or some issue becomes less important, though it is important, it becomes less important because you want to be well. And this giant is trying to take you down. We've got to learn how to be giant killers how to run and face our giants and not cower down. Financial hardship. If you can't pay your bills, if you have no income, and you're really struggling to keep your head above the water and provide for your family, that can overwhelm you, and that can be a giant. But I'm here to tell you, my God is a faithful God. Social disaster. Social disaster is just, not just in America, but around the world. Social disaster, rioting, lawlessness. It's unhinged. A guy robs a bank recently, spends one night in jail, gets out the next morning. He robs two more banks. Lawless. Just lawless. Those are giants. And those giants have a tendency just to kind of weigh on you. Divorce. Devastating. Devastates those who are in the midst of divorce. It impacts our children. We've come to a place in America where an overwhelming number of children are raised in a fatherless home. 
It's devastating. Social disaster. And then the biggie. The biggie is death. But I have good news concerning even death, and that's a biggie. <laughs> is 1 Corinthians 15 says, the last enemy. Say enemy. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And then it goes on in 1 Corinthians 15 and says something really fascinating that I found yesterday as I was spending time with the Lord, something that I had read many, many times and just had never really grasped the truth of it. And, and it's so easy to know Scripture or to know the biblical stories of great men and women of faith and become so familiar with it that we just gloss over it and we don't learn anything else that God may show us. And I believe God will show us some things today. But just in 1 Corinthians 15, it says this about this enemy, death. Death is not my friend. I've heard preachers say, you need to, you know, trials and tribulations are your friends. Duh. Don't need friends like that telling me stuff. As I said Wednesday night, don't ever go to someone for advice that criticizes you. Careful who you listen to. 1 Corinthians 15 says this, this corruptible, this temporary corruptible body, the Bible says, though my outward man perishes, my inward man is renewed day by day. This corruptible body must put on the incorruptible body. In other words, my earthly suit has to be shed through death that I might put on my heavenly suit, my heavenly body, and in this transition of this thing called death, death, this enemy, is swallowed up in victory when we step out of this earth suit and are instantly, if you can even use it's faster than an instant, be in the presence of the Lord. That's when death is swallowed up in victory. Now, Jesus made that possible. This corruptible must be cast off in order to step into our heavenly, eternal body in the presence of the Lord. Death is not my friend. Death is the enemy. And Jesus killed it off. It no longer has a stronghold on us. Now, there are a lot of social media warriors out there. Have you noticed that? And this is what Jesus said, and I'm going to apply this to the social media warriors. Jesus said... Uh, Whereunto shall I liken this generation? It's like children sitting in the market calling out their fellows. Now, when I teach on leadership, I'm always reminded of the story that I read many years ago, and I've shared many times in leadership, about a gentleman walking down the streets of a city. And as he's walking down the sidewalk, he comes across a big porch filled with children. There's 15 or so children. They're on the front porch. And as he walks by, he stops and he sees the children. He says, kids, it's a beautiful, beautiful day. Why aren't y'all playing? And one of the little children, he looks up and says, sir, we are playing. He said, well, what do you mean you're playing? Oh, yeah, we're playing war. He said, playing war, you're all sitting on the porch. He said, yes, sir, we're all generals. <laughs> the church is filled with that kind of generals. We think we're playing the game and that we're in the, on the field of competition because we're all sitting on the porch. It's time you and I got off the porch and off the steps and got into the arena and stood up on the Word of God and refused to cower down because there's giants trying to intimidate us. Hi, I'm Perry Black right here at Arkansas Christian Academy, and I want to strongly encourage you to visit our website or call us and take a tour of ACA. You know, over the past four years, our graduating seniors have received over $1.3 million in college scholarships. We're a fully accredited faith-based Christian school, and in this environment in our world, you need to strongly consider Arkansas Christian Academy. Take a tour, make a phone call, visit our website. We'd love to visit you right here at ACA. God bless. 
Here's what 1 Timothy says in chapter 6, verse 12, a very familiar, fight a good fight of faith. 1 Peter says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks around seeking who may devour, whom you're to resist steadfast in the faith. See, Mike Tyson said it like this. He says, everyone has a plan when they get in the ring until they get hit in the mouth. See, when you get hit in the mouth, when you're facing the giant, when you get the diagnosis, when you look at the bank statement, when you see the shutoff notice, when you see the divorce decree, then you decide, are you a person of faith or have you just been faking it all this time? You've got to learn how to face your giants. And there's a lot of them out there. Mark says it like this. Jesus recorded. Jesus said it. Mark recorded. He says, as Jesus speaking from the days of John the Baptist to the present day, the kingdom of heaven suffered violent and the violent take it by force. You know, I looked that up in seven or eight different translations. You know what it said? The kingdom of heaven suffered violent and the violent take it by force. The violent seize it. For the kingdom of heaven to work here on this earth, we must be people who know how to seize on the promises of God and refuse to let go. In Revelation, it says something like this, let no man take your crown. See, I say when it comes to fighting, you've got to fight like the third monkey trying to get on the ark. You've got to learn how to fight for your life and for the rights of your loved ones. You got to fight. So you may not be able to control every circumstance. You may not be able to control every attack that comes your way. But what you can in the power of God, because Christ in you and his ability in you, you can keep every circumstance from controlling you. In warfare, you may not win every firefight. But in Christ, you are guaranteed the ultimate victory. You got to fight like your life depends on it. Say this with me. The battle is the Lord's. You know, we spiritualize that, and that's a spiritual truth. It's right out of the Bible. David said it himself. The battle's the Lord's. But I want to remind you of something. David went into battle with a pocket full of rocks. He didn't just pray. He got up and went straight toward the giant. We're going to look at that familiar story, yes, but truths that perhaps can be applied and understood in a way maybe we've never seen or heard before. Back in the original TNT building, one Sunday morning, I was walking from my office toward the auditorium. And there, many of you that remember that building well over 10 years ago before the fire of God. Anyway, there, there was an artist in our church that painted a picture of Goliath in one of the classrooms. And as I walked toward the auditorium, I looked to my left in the doorway, and there was a little boy in there, and he was up against the wall with Goliath painted there, and he was, over, he was 10 foot tall because all we had was 10-foot walls. And the little boy was standing there with his head up against the wall like that, and then he turned to look to see how he compared to Goliath. And he was just a little fella. Giants often, by their very size, can be terribly intimidating. But I'm going to tell you, as the Word of God has declared openly to us, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. You're a thousand times bigger on the inside than you are on the outside. Don't be moved by the size of the giants in your life. Stay on top of the water with Jesus and get out of the boat of doubt. Now, the battle is the Lord's. But we've got to fight like our life depends on it, because in many cases, it does. Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, he said, Now finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. See, the church, say, that's me. Church is not a building. Church is people. We're the body of Christ. The church has to wake up and work and, work and walk together in truth. Everybody say truth. 
My Jesus is bigger than all this social stuff. He's bigger than all this political stuff. He's bigger than you, and he's bigger than every giant you and I will ever face. But we've got to get up as people of prayer and put shoe leather to it and fight the good fight of faith because the good fight of faith, you do not lose. You win. See, David said the battle's the Lord's, but the David still had to sling that rock. People say, well, you know, but why did David get five stones? Well, it wasn't because he needed five for Goliath. If you read the Bible, Goliath had four ugly brothers. They were big and they were ugly, just as bad as Goliath. And David said, you know what, I take out one giant, there may be some more. Bring it out. Just bring it out. Now let's look at some keys to being giant slayers. And what is the giant in your eyes? Is it divorce? Is it finances? Is it COVID? Is it fear? Is it confusion? Is it social stuff? What is the giant that you're facing? It's real. And it's real to you. And it's real to God. So I'm going to share with you a story that we've all heard since we were little children, most likely. So, as we're facing these giants... We've got to know God's plan and purpose for our life, and we don't lose. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail him. Now, how did he get to Saul? Well, he came to see his brothers, and he gets there. And while he's there with this anticipation of watching his big brothers, his big, man, it's going to be so cool. My brothers are in the army right on. That's cool. He gets there, and they're all hiding from Goliath. Now, what fascinates me, King Saul stood head and shoulders above all of his peers. King Saul was a big fella. And yet nobody's going out to face Goliath, including the king. So David gets there to find nobody's willing to fight the giant. So we find him in verse 32, 1 Samuel 17. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go out and fight the Philistines. Now, I want you to visualize with me, David, he's, he's about this big. Maybe this big. Maybe he's really tall for a Jewish teenager. Maybe he's this big. And here's Goliath. And here's Saul. Head and shoulders above everybody. And David shows up with a bunch of cowards, God's mighty army hiding from one giant. And his four Bubba's. And David says, let no man's heart fail him because of this guy. Your servant will go fight him. And what does Saul say? What? You're just a kid. Saul looks at him and says, you're not able to go out against this Philistine to fight him. For you're just a youth. As a youth pastor. As a children's pastor. Pastor Lance. You don't want to really get us fired up? Tell these young people. Tell them they can't do God's will. Tell them they can't face the giants in their life. Tell them they're disqualified. Paul wrote to Timothy, a young man, maybe 17 to 19 years old, who was helping organize and establish the churches where Paul preached and Paul would go on to another, another community. He said, let no man despise thy youth. Don't look up here and despise me because I'm so much younger than all you. I'm a thousand times bigger on the inside. You're not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You're just a youth, and he's a man of war from his youth. Well, how did Goliath get there where he was? He learned how to fight as he was young. Don't disqualify this generation. See, everyone may not believe in you, so you better. You better. Everybody might not get on your bandwagon, but you better learn how to play first fiddle. Because you and God are a majority. Hi, I'm Perry Black right here at Second Chance Youth Ranch TV on Victory Television Network. And I'd like to invite you personally to join us every Thursday night at 11 p.m. as we look at the need for fostering, adoption, and mentoring. What a great opportunity you have to join us every Thursday night at 11 p.m. right here on Victory Television Network, and I look forward to seeing you.
See, he says, you're just a kid. But I noticed that King Saul's not putting on his armor going out to fight. He just disqualifying the only person willing to. He said, listen, your servant kept his father's sheep. And when the lion came and the bear came and took one of my daddy's sheep, I, I took them by their beard and I slew them and saved that sheep. We need people in the body of Christ that will face our giants, go through the rigorous training process of fighting the lion and the bear so that when we actually fight the giant, we're already equipped and we already know how to use the weapon of God's warfare. He said, uh, thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, verse 36, and this uncircumcised Philistine, in other words, this heretic, this heathen, has the audacity of hope. A little play on words there. He has the audacity. He's not, he's not putting me down. He has the audacity, this uncircumcised, uncovenant heretic, this heathen, has the audacity to intimidate God's army. Who does he think he is? He said, this servant, this servant has slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be with one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. We serve a living God, and he is a faithful God, and he's faithful to a thousand generations. When you face your giant, be reminded you serve a faithful God living God. See, David said, moreover, the Lord has delivered me out of the paw of the lion and the bear. He said, it wasn't my prowess. It wasn't just because I'm super gifted. The Lord did this. Point number two is a real beautiful point. Every day's a training day. Every day's a training day. Because if you don't learn the lessons of today and how to use the weapons of warfare today and the armor of God today, and you don't pass the test today, and you don't face the lion or the bears of today, you're going to have to face them tomorrow. And the problem is tomorrow's going to have their own. So go ahead and take care of business today. Don't put it off. Face the lion and the bear and know God will deliver you from their hand. And as you're being trained, see, if you're, if you're going to wait till you get the biggest diagnosis, the death-threatening diagnosis, instead of believing God when you have the sniffles, when you have a headache, when you have a joint pain, if you don't begin to use your faith now on the lion and the bear, you'll be overwhelmed when you face your giant. You'll just be a mushroom sniffer. You got to face them. See, everybody won't believe in you, but you've got to believe in yourself. You've got to believe in Christ in you, that you and God are a majority. You've got to believe that every day is a training day, so don't despise the small beginnings. God was painstaking. He was staking, and I was in pain, <laughs> endeavoring to figure out how to be in the ministry and how to walk out God's will for my life. But little by little, day by day, being faithful in his service. And the fruit of the Spirit says faith in the King James, but in the original text it means faithfulness. Being faithful in small things, God can then entrust with, to you greater things. Oh, man, but that's so hard. Every child grows up wanting to drive a car, yet they can't figure out how to operate a dishwasher. Be faithful in little. When you become a servant, when you remain humble, God will train you and He will deliver you from the lion and the bear. And in that training, when you face the big giants that Satan and society are going to send your way, you will run to meet them. Every day is a training day. Here's a real simple quote. Learn to face the little giants, before they grow up. Just because you ignore it, they don't go away. They just keep growing up. Face it and be an overcomer. 
And he took his staff, David did, in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, uh, even in a script. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to Goliath. He says, you can't go out and fight him. David says, no, wait, 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 wait. You, you can't tell me that. He took his staff. He finds those smooth stones and he heads out to take on Goliath. And the Philistine came on and drew near to David, and the man bare the shield went before him, had his armor bare in front of him. And when the Philistine looked about, saw David, he disdained him. And said, just like, just only worse than what King Saul said, he disdained him. He said, he's but a youth and ruddy and fair countenance. And the Philistine said to David, my dog, the answer is yes. Can we just be honest? There are some people, they even call each other dog. You know what I'm saying? What I'm saying, dog? Yeah, he's a dog. He's a heathen. So the servant, he said, your servant, he said, I went out when that lion and bear came to steal my father's sheep, and I took them by the beard, and I slew them. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and the uncircumcised Philistine will be just like one of them, because he's defiled the living God. Are you kidding me? Who does he think he is? Come out here. Point number five. You don't have to remember all these. These are all on Family Church Brian app. And you can go back and review this message. There's always going to be some big shot. There's always going to be some big shot that will try to intimidate you. We're living in a world of big shots. They forget they've been elected to represent, and now they want to be tyrants and dictators. All i got to say is, Goliath... Giant, you may think you're a big shot, but David was a good shot. Help him, honey. Normally Jennifer helps, but even Janet's in on this one. Oh, I love that woman. There's always going to be some big shot trying to, imitate, to intimidate you. But greater is he that's in you. He's the one that if you will pray and believe God and slay the lion and the bear and his ability when it comes to the giant of cancer, leukemia, COVID, death, divorce, financial hardship, you will be able to take the stone, the gift of God, and by faith slay the giant. 